We are back and we are joined now by Ed Zitron of the Where's Your Ed Out at newsletter, host of the Better Offline podcast. We'll put a link to all of that in the description. Ed, thanks so much for coming on the show today. My pleasure. So uh, you ha write very uh, well on your in your newsletter about tech and about AI and about where the internet is going. Um, like, what what is <clears throat> the reasoning I would say behind this almost like late stage internet uh, reality that we're dealing with right now? Because from what from me reading some of your work and what i've seen it almost seems like everything is a carbon copy of a carbon copy of a carbon copy and the the experience of connection that was supposedly what the internet was supposed to uh engender is far in the rear view in my estimation so a lot of it comes down to growth. All these companies have become all of the major internet platforms have become growth machines. The street really the markets are all they care about. And the easiest way to make the markets like you is show that you will grow 10, 20% every quarter. This is unsustainable, but it's why you're seeing things like Instagram's algorithm sending you things and showing you things that aren't people you follow, things you don't want to see. It's why Google search results don't show you what you want to see, but what Google would like you to see. Because all of these businesses need to scrape bits of revenue to show the street that they're always growing. How does that end up making everything normalized? Well, when most media properties are based on the idea of pleasing Google search or what used to be a virality over social media, they create content to match what search engines like. As a result, you see a lot of content that's like, oh yeah, the Super Bowl is, when does it stream? And where can I stream this new show? Right. And indeed, you get headlines like the, ma the massive amount of headlines around Biden's age. All that popped up because... It did traffic. It's what people wanted to read about, kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy. Wrong or right, it's what happens. On social networks, TikTok in particular, you're seeing this. It's why you're seeing a lot of two-box stuff where there's one video that they've stolen and then some video of Minecraft, for example, with some words over it. It's because the algorithm likes that. And the algorithm makes that stuff popular, which in turn reinforces the fact that the algorithm likes something which makes people make more of it. Everyone's dancing to the tune of robots. Can you define the algorithm for people? Um, the how algorithms get written, how increasingly it appears that it's relying on generative AI, um, and how kind of like in that how uh, it, there's a lot of failure that's happening, and not necessarily <laughs> um, a prioritization of the internet kind of working well for people. So putting aside gener generative AI, because that is somewhat separate. So these algorithms are the instruction sets of these networks. So the algorithm for Instagram is the thing that says, what should I show this person next? What video should they see? What ad should they see? What sponsored content should they see? And that's based on the inputs from the user, but also billions, trillions of data points based on other users and indeed what they want to click and what will keep them on the platform. In the case of Google's search algorithm, PageRank was the original one. It was literally just who links to this page the most. What, what inbound links does this page get? That's what makes it notable. Now it is far more black box. You just don't know how Google works. But for the most part, it is how respectable a source is, but that is a continually manipulated thing. With generative AI, that's a whole different ballgame. And that's honestly a whole separate question, I would say, when it comes to the ramifications of it. So can you then uh, expand on those ramifications uh, and, and what, you know, the, what it's looking like currently? So generative AI as a thing is what you'd see in like ChatGPT or Google's Gemini. And it generates an answer based on a user's input, based on the training data that has been ingested by the AI and Thus, the, out, the tagging of said data and the output is generated from that. This is why, by the way, you see hallucinations, because generative AI, artificial intelligence, doesn't know anything. It is not intelligence. It does not have an intellect. It says, draw me a picture of a monkey. You, it gets that. It looks at the billions of data points, and it goes, okay, I think a monkey looks like this. That's why you get weird things with like five, five ten fingers on a person, for example, because it's just guessing. Now, Google has been talking about its generative search experience, and this is a very scary one. There were some 
uh, data that just came out of Ad Week yesterday, we were saying 20 to 60% of Google search traffic to media outlets could just go away. Because what Google is planning is generative search, where the AI is answering. It's not searching the internet anymore. Google would no longer just look for things based on the page pages it's pulled together. No, it will say, based on my training data, which is partially informed by the internet and connected to the internet, this is what I'd like to provide you. What's scary about that is it centralizes data. It is not Google saying, here are some pages that are the answer. It is Google saying, I have the answer myself as Google, and this is what you'll get. And if you're worried about it being wrong, you should be. Yeah. Well, I mean, that is a big part of what we're seeing, I think, even in social media feeds, right, where it's all curated from an algorithm that's basically determining. And again, you're the expert. I'm just uh, speaking to, from my own experience, but that's curating it based on like kind of dubious standards and past y your past interests and an amalgamation of certain things as opposed to like what people want to see or the straightforward timeline, for example. And you're seeing this particularly badly in X, formerly known as right. Twitter, rate my news, stop biz, whatever it's called these days. <laughs> so Twitter is particularly bad because it used to have a much larger trust and safety department, which used to make sure that, say, complete misinformation and disinformation didn't get fed into your For You feed. The For You feed did not used to be the focus of Twitter. Mm -hmm. There was a certain level of algorithm. Here is a post you might like, but now the for you feed is the focus of the platform. They force most people onto it when they load the platform. It sucks. It's and even before Elon Musk bought it, Twitter really had a bias towards right wing news sources. There was a lot of press around this. Now it's got worse. Now it's focusing itself on the worst kind of right wing firebrands. Now, you know it's bad when, like, Eel Miles Chong is a, considered a news source. And yes, <laughs> yes. You know when you're algorithmically... Still Gray is not... That ain't good eating. Post That's not good. <laughs> yeah, it's... The, That's the yes, one that exactly. called me Mike a Solana. Right, yeah. Or Lex Fridman. Yeah. You, when you know that these are the standards of media, you know something's up with the algorithm. Right. But, I mean, Facebook. When Facebook used to have their... When they used to care about news, they used to feed in vile news sources, right-wing misinformation all the time, the kind of anti-Muslim, anti-COVID vaccination stuff. They were utter scumbags. Facebook is just as bad, if not worse, well, and has done more threads, damage than Twitter as well. Sorry to interrupt, but isn't that in part why threads did not take off? Because the, the entire thing is an algorithmically determined feed based on like what threads has determined you want to see. Correct. But the other reason that threads didn't take off ironically is because they're very anti-news and also i don't know who in meta hq thought let's let all the instagram people make a network full of comments but threads feels like a dying mall it's it's a very boring place full of it's like a linkedin after dark which isn't particularly fun yeah and it's just bizarre because they have a massive base but you can really see in threads that Mark Zuckerberg and Meta, they're not good at building social networks. Elon Musk has been trying to kill Twitter with his many bad decisions, but it survives still because it's still a good platform for posting and for talking to people. Threads is not. Threads has poor search, terrible algorithm, boring algorithm. When I was first on Threads, I kid you not, I was getting the most vile anti-trans stuff. And I tried telling, but I was like, this is bad. And I was just like, well, well, you know, it's just your three. Just block them and move on. It's like, no, yeah, no, this is a problem. And that has now disappeared. Now it's uh, memes from three weeks ago, which is not better. Right. <laughs> yeah. So the endless growth piece, I mean, that's not necessarily something new that kills products. Um, but in terms of social media, it appears to have a particularly acute effect because the product is something different than had been pushed by other companies that are caving in on themselves due to endless growth because the product was also generated by the user. It's, you know, mm -hmm. there's advertising now, yes, but the base of why these platforms became popular was user-generated content and then also yes. user-consuming. Um, but... The, the, 
with the endless growth model, you have to, th there's, there's a cap on eventually, like we're at a saturation point in terms of user generated content to a degree. So when you have to keep growing for your shareholders, what does that mean? You have to provide new products. And um, it appears to me that when you're making all of the the user experience kind of based in the algorithm or based outside of what people want to see and you're just feeding them things to make it more and more money, then there the user experience is going to continue to disintegrate and they're going to have to rely even more on these new ways to raise funds to grow and in, in you know a a in a capitalist system. So the unique thing with social networks is looking at it as they've like, this has been going on a while. And why is it just bad now? You need to look at it as more of a continuum. The only thing that grows forever is a cancer. So these networks are growing and abusing their users. And they have been for some time. Things have got worse over the last eight to 10 years. And Facebook in particular has gone from a platform that was about connecting people to a platform that I would argue is, about disconnecting people. It's about keeping people on the platform as much as possible, making them click as many things as possible, feed them as many ads, get them on there and kind of abuse them as much as possible until they leave. I don't think we're at the saturation point of use generated content, but the problem is that the focus has come off of that. And what algorithms raise is no longer content that a user has made that's cued. Everything I see on my Facebook feed, for example, is nakedly viral content. It's stuff created to make the algorithm share it. The ads on Instagram are all, most of the ads I get, by the way, are for games that don't exist. It's like a specific kind of game. It's like, oh, you can play this game and you click through and it's some kind of weird microtransaction filled game. That is the experience of many people on Instagram, by the way. It's all just like terrible direct to consumer stuff and fake apps. This is something that's happening because Facebook can't be a sustainable business. It is, by the way. It is absolutely. Facebook could be left as it is, not growing, not contracting, or maybe contracting a little, and still stay stable and insanely profitable. Not going to work for Mark Zuckerberg, though. Not going to work right. for him. He must have more. But the problem is, the actual saturation point of this is, there just aren't enough people. There aren't enough people being born to feed into these companies. And as these companies become more abusive to their users, the users will want to create less content. This yeah. then, in turn, makes the networks more boring, more generic, more full of stuff built for the algorithm, which you're seeing across every single network. Other than Twitter, no idea what's happening there, and I don't think Musk knows either. But what you're going to see now is as they go, oh, there's not enough user-generated content, we'll have to make a generative AI that replaces user content. Where does the generative AI get its gener... Where's it train on? That's right, user generated content. So, what happens when there's not enough user generated content? Well, it starts generating on the stuff that was built for the algorithm. This is where Jathan Sadowski's Habsburg AI comes in. When AI models are trained on other AI outputs, they become inbred, they get weird, their eyes go a bit too far apart, they don't look so right, they don't sound or look good. And this is where the internet dies, by the way. When the internet becomes so bereft of user content caused by platforms attacking users and making posting content worse, that the internet must replace users with AI that is trained on a lack of user content and thus is just dumb and boring and generic. Why would why are people gonna come online? Like it's, this is this is this is dangerous. Yeah. This is really dangerous. Well it's a, it's the snake that begins to eat its tail at a certain point, mm -hmm. right? And then then the entire product um collapses to a degree. You mentioned Elon Musk there. Do you think that his just complete idiocy and public failures are masking this overall, you know, wider disintegration of the internet that you describe because it seems to be shared not just on Twitter, it's also uh, all over Meta and Facebook. So the funny thing is with Twitter is he wants to do exactly what everyone else is doing. He yes. would love to have a growth machine, but he's so bad at it that right. every time he tries to, he's like, oh, then we're going to uh, remove likes and retweets. That will be good. And everyone's just furious. He's like, uh, 
I, right. I don't know. I, what it, uh, the and word then he tweet quote tweets a doge. Was like in the dictionary. <laughs> that's the that's the kind of market yeah. and marketing dream that you you're gifted that on a platform. Now let's make it posts on X as opposed to tweeting. It's just insane. Tweeting, <laughs> tweeting was literally the second term after googling. Yes, that became a descriptive yes. term of a company name and he's like no we can't we can't have that we must call it x just to give you an idea of how great the x.com brand is there is a cnet story from the very early 2000s about x.com the previous financial app that was named that and what's great about it is it's a story about how people were just able to send money from other people's accounts without providing any kind of information just how bad he was at developing that he's like no i need to go with the brand again yeah. but also just he does not know how to build a company, and you're seeing that. The only reason we haven't got Twitter in this mode is because he does not know how. Because he's like, I need to stop the wokes. The, the wokes are they are the reason that people hate this platform. Versus like the fact that it's falling apart, the fact that there's someone responding nudes in bio to every third post. Yeah. It's just, it's a very, it's a remarkable thing. Twitter is probably surviving and chugging along because Elon Musk is too stupid to monetize it. Exactly. It rocks. I honestly a horrible guy, but very, very funny. Very funny. Very funny. But like at the same time, though, we're we're not necessarily like like the TikTok uh, bill that was passed. Curious yeah. to get your thoughts. We opened the show talking about it. Just essentially how it's it's clearly, in my opinion, doing the work of American capitalists and their big tech platforms, you know, Meta and Facebook are deeply concerned about TikTok and have been for years because it's the competitor mm -hmm. that's taking over their market share. And they seem to um, be uh, one of the driving forces behind this bill. Um, but like, what happens if this actually goes through? And I think the Senate will not pass it, uh, need 60 votes, but if it does, and then the sale is pushed to a company that has the billions of dollars to acquire the American arm of TikTok. And then these companies just get bigger and bigger. And it's this like monopoly that becomes this, the, this inbred uh, AI content machine that you describe. So also the other thing that people don't realize about TikTok is TikTok is big because they get they burn billions of dollars. Billions and billions of dollars. They are deeply unprofitable. They made about 20 billion dollars and they spent about they lost about 6 billion dollars. So anyone buying this will need to be able to generate that money in exactly the same way TikTok did. I don't believe I think like a foreclosed house they're going to rip out certain things when they sell it. And that's if they have to. This is going to be a long, protracted legal situation. The bill kind of sucks. It's just, it's been rushed through. Also, there are many things we're accusing TikTok of. About massive data troves they have on people. The amount of people, that things they collect. The ways they use, the ways they abuse users. And there are, if the reports are true, the stuff they, like TikTok's been doing against like, dissidents in Hong Kong, that's disgraceful. That is a problem. And you can't ignore that. But at the same time, if the problem is that this company uses a bunch of data to manipulate people, why is that a problem now? Why is that a problem with Instagram? Instagram's been doing that. There are internal Facebook studies about how bad Instagram is for teen girls. There yeah. are, like Cambridge Analytica, kind of a mess. But nevertheless, you can fairly easily prove that Facebook was on some level the reason that Brexit happened. Like, it contributed to it. It's not the only thing, just to be clear. Same with the Trump campaign. It's obviously not the only reason, but it certainly didn't help. Nothing really happened there. Nothing stops. We have this thing where we, and I, by the way, sure, we shouldn't have American data going to foreign combatants or people we're not happy with. Fine, whatever. I can accept that. But why are we fine with data brokers like Intellius or Axiom or whatever, existing that have trillions of data points on american citizens that can tell you the name and address of an american why are these not the problems there was a report in the times from Kashmir hill about how car companies are starting to leak car information the the information about where you drive to to insurance companies to raise your rates burying the approval inside of terms and conditions where's the worry about that that is damaging more americans than anything tiktok is doing
Exactly. I just feel that when it comes to tech, the government, regardless of the party in control, has their head up their ass. Well, and then let's be clear, too. They're also saying that part of the reason that they want to push forward on this is that young people are becoming too pro-Palestinian. So what is this? Is, is the reasoning is the reasoning that TikTok is helping China in their suppression efforts? Or is it that you want to suppress <laughs> uh, certain other kinds of speech that are harmful to the United States? interests i think that the pro-palestinian thing is them just coming up with another justification for genocide let's to be clear true i think that that's just a way of branding this today if it was not that it would be something else and i think people are becoming pro-palestinian because they keep seeing what israel is doing to palestine personally. exactly right, right i think that's probably causing them it's just that is just a convenient thing i wouldn't focus on that it's a stupid justification it's idiotic I don't think they're thinking about this in a giant mind control way. I don't think many people in the House or Congress understand what they're talking about here. I think that there is a vague xenophobia. They're like, I don't trust the Chinese. I don't trust them. Other than the fact we do tons of manufacturing with them and they're critical to American trade. Yeah. And many Where companies are iPhones deal with them. made, by the way, but that's they that, are, uh, but that's the, owned the by next... an American company, so it's totally Yeah, exactly. Fine. It's okay that Foxconn has people killing themselves. That's okay. Yeah. That's fine. TikTok not because and there was that sixty minutes report with this guy with an obscene name, like Cold Kitchen or something. It was right. an insane name for a guy. He was like a national security expert he's like imagine if uh, there were 100 billion chinese sensors inside your phone can our government officials and our inter our experts in international policy be more nuanced than the song californication it's just kind of frustrating to me at this point because this isn't informed by anything this was rushed through it does not suggest anyone has used it like they know someone that's used it that shouldn't be enough we should demand more from our elected officials, but I guess that is ultimately the problem you discuss on this show a lot. Absolutely. Um, so I, I like I guess before we leave you, Ed, I'm curious about some of these other tech announcements when we're talking about the endless growth that some of these companies have to engage in, whether it's the stupid ass thing on that uh, Apple glasses, what the Google Glass, Vision app, Pro, I mean, yeah. whatever it's the new updated Apple uh virtual reality where you're wearing goggles and to see out of them you are looking through cameras <laughs> right in front of your face as opposed to you know just having it be see-through so you can see your surroundings in front of you whatever um like who even is buying this and and whether it's the, the facebook metaverse too is how nakedly is this just an effort to drive more investment so separating out the metaverse and the vision pro so the metaverse, the whole thing, I did an episode of Better Offline on actually both of these things, the metaverse and Vision Pro. In the case of the metaverse, nothing was happening. It was entirely made up. It's insane that that happened. Mark Zuckerberg went out there and said, the metaverse is here. He did videos that just nakedly lied about what it could do and then mostly tried to resell you VR stuff that existed for years, Horizon Workrooms, Horizon Worlds. No one used it. No one liked it. it Billions of dollars of wasted capital thrown around and then burned. And then the moment generative AI came along, Zuckerberg was off chasing that with Boz. Bosworth, his CTO, another goblin. Um, in the case of the metaverse, it was very much a capital driving thing. It was just another way. To, it was a way to rebrand the company. It was a way to get away from the very poisonous name Facebook. And it worked. It worked briefly. Now people know what Meta does, and the Metaverse never created anything. I think he assumed that the good times would keep rolling. In Apple's case with the Vision Pro, I have a slightly different feeling, which is, and I own one, bought one to do a better offline review. And you know what? It's interesting. It also gives you a headache. It's very strange. Three and a half thousand dollars, and it doesn't do much. But the reason that I don't, and by the way, that was released too early very much to show growth. It was so that Apple could book $700 million of sales and say, look, we built a new thing. We have a new business line. It was released probably two years too early. It should have been half to a third of the price. But nevertheless, I appreciate that someone made something new. The Vision Pro was something new. Too expensive. Didn't do enough. But there are moments where you're like, oh, this is a new thing. Watching movies on it is very cool. But it's also three, dollars $4,000. <laughs> too much. It doesn't do enough. But the things it does are new, but they rushed it out on the subject of eternal growth so that they could prove that they have new business lines. It's an incomplete product. 
lots of people have said this. It's insane that they sold a device that hurts your head, by the way, and it really does give me a nasty headache. That's the pain right here. And it's frustrating because that one, that one actually angers me as much as the metaverse, just because you could have waited two or three years and made something that's actually really cool. There's something uh, kind of a uh, space agnostic computing space. It makes sense when it works, but that's a load bearing when. So yeah, Apple rushing stuff out, that is the raw economy. That is the growth at all cost economy. Well, uh, really great stuff. I encourage everybody to listen to the Better Offline podcast and read Where's Your Ed At. Uh, Ed Zitron, thanks so much for your time today. Really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. For sure.